here uh, on the Digital Hub, the recording video. Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, as we told uh, before, we are uh, uh, Paolo Mazzanti and Marco Bertini. We are working uh, in the University of Florence in NIC, Media Integration and Communication Center, is uh, uh, a center of excellence uh, established by Italian Ministry for Culture some years ago. Uh, NIC is uh, an interdisciplinary center for advanced uh, research on many topics, uh, especially computer vision, multimedia technology, and uh, artificial intelligence. Also, in the context of the cultural heritage, uh, this is the reason why uh, the Tuscany region activated at NIC, the NIMEC, another competence center, New Media for Cultural Heritage, focused on digital tools for uh, cultural heritage sectors. And NIMEC works like research labs, an interdisciplinary programs and training space, and a demonstration space for results and project. Uh, regarding uh, this uh, webinar, uh, Nick is uh, a partner of the Reinerit uh, Consortium, coordinated by Bank of Cyprus Cultural Foundation, and is composed of the consortium uh, at uh, 12 partners. Uh, the project has received funding uh, from uh, European Union, Union's Horizon 2020 Innovation and Research Program. Uh, the mission of Renerit is uh, to uh, create a, a new and innovative model of sustainable heritage management, uh, creating uh, a network, a uh, dynamic and uh, innovative and uh, uh, interdisciplinary uh, uh, network uh, composed by heritage professionals, uh, policy makers, stakeholders, uh, tech experts regarding uh, cultural heritage sectors. You can visit our uh, website website and follow uh, on our social media. Uh, we are uh, on uh, Twitter, Facebook, uh, YouTube, uh, LinkedIn, uh, TikTok, uh, and uh, Instagram. Regarding uh, the, uh, the, the main, uh, uh, the key issues and uh, the, the main topic, the pillar of uh, Renerit, you can see in the slide, innovation, disruption, and sustainability. We work during uh, these months regarding uh, these three important topics. I, uh, in the slide, you can see the work packages related to our work. Uh, we are together uh, to present uh, the toolkit uh, uh, of the Renerit. Uh, we are the leader, uh, we, Mick, are the leader of this, uh, uh, this uh, work package, but it's important to uh, consider also the other topics, especially the topics uh, related to work package two regarding the needs. Uh, the work we made during this month is, uh, is regarding uh, to uh, the, the needs and the, the guidelines for uh, professionals in the context of uh, uh, cultural heritage. Uh, we uh, uh, also uh, created in, in the work package two the digital hub, so our tools, as Marco told you before, will also uh, publish it uh, in the Digital Lab. The Digital Lab is uh, an open and uh, a, a space to share experiences, uh, codes, uh, open source uh, tools, uh, and uh, best practice, uh, and some other uh, interesting materials that then you can discover uh, visiting the, the Digital Lab. So uh, in this part, uh, I want uh, to present to you some important results uh, that uh, was useful for us to help uh, in uh, our strategy to developing, uh, to develop uh, the, the, the toolkit and uh, the, the applications. Uh, from the uh, work package too, uh, from the primary research uh, uh, conducting during uh, these months uh, with uh, uh, surveys, with the focus groups, we identified uh, the main target. And they are visitors, but especially young museum visitors uh, uh, that are more likely to use uh, digital tools. 
and uh, professional uh, related to small and mid-sized uh, museums that uh, have less capacity to use digital services, so they need more, uh, um, um, they, they, have, they have the needs to, 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 to use our, our tools. And uh, regarding the uh, secondary research, uh, we identified also the approach, uh, an approach uh, um, people-centered, open-minded, because the tools are used, uh, the tools that we are producing are used to interact with visitors in dynamic and powerful uh, ways, uh, offering uh, uh, transformative learning experience uh, during all the visitor journey, before, during, after the visit, and providing playful and immersive experiences that are able to trigger emotions, inspire creativity, and participatory learning. Uh, during this uh, uh, research, we identified uh, some useful uh, uh, examples, for example, for ex uh, some useful study. Uh, this uh, is one study uh, report uh, regarding the role of emotions in museum uh, published by a network of NEMO. I edited this uh, uh, report to collaboration with uh, Margarita San in the context of the Learning Museum uh, Network uh, of the NEMO. We published this uh, in 2021 and uh, uh, this is important to identify the role of emotion. And uh, for example, I, I use this, uh, this quote uh, by uh, John Falk, the director of Institute for Learning Innovation in the USA. He said that the museum experience is not linear, but uh, is a cyclical and dynamic experience. And emotion plays a critical role at every stage. You can see in the, in the um, figure uh, designed by John Falk, uh, uh, people go to museum with an idea with some needs uh, guided especially from uh, the friend uh, recommendations and uh, they have an idea uh, of this museum when they are in the museum if the idea match uh, if they have a, a peak of experience they remember better that experience and recommend the museum uh, to friends so this is interesting for us uh, because we was inspired uh, um, by this idea of uh, visiting museum and visitor journey. Um, and uh, also regarding uh, technology, another uh, contributor from uh, Professor Alberto Del Bimbo, the past director of MIC, uh, he brought that the digital technology can extend uh, the, uh, the museum visit into uh, sessions of uh, experiential education. So uh, technology can help to create a relationship between art and the visitors. So this is important to define our strategy and to define the tools we need to produce uh, during uh, the, the, um, the, this, the, the inside the toolkit of uh, Reinerit. And so this is important to identify uh, an idea of a museum that we want to, uh, to promote a digital museum uh, in the sense of mixed and extended museum experience because uh, 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 we need to rethink uh, uh, the museum experience in diversity, in plurality, uh, considering uh, uh, plurality in the sense of many persons, uh, many ways of interaction, different tools, uh, spaces, and context. Empathetic museums, uh, considering the cultural organization, a people-centered organization, an institution with a clear vision of its uh, role with uh, the community, and uh, inspired by values like participation, inclusion, and co-creation. And finally, museums uh, relational and out of the box, uh, in the sense that uh, museums not only uh, exhibition spaces, but uh, also uh, places for uh, research, uh, for learning, for improving well-being, uh, exchanging idea, and socializing with uh, with other visitors inside the museums. 
So this is our idea, and uh, so we can, uh, uh, we, uh, for us uh, and uh, from our research, uh, uh, the artificial intelligence and computer vision based tools uh, are becoming an innovative trend. But what about your experience? Now I want to open a survey, just two questions for you to test your experience regarding this, uh, this tool. Just a moment. Um, okay, I invite you to, to, to you to, to vote. Uh, can you see the, the questionnaire? Yes, I see that uh, you are voting. I'm seeing that uh, you are continuous, continue to, to vote. Okay, I, I can, uh, can I end the, the voting? Maybe yes, stop and share results with us. Can you see the results? Can you see? Yes, thank you. And uh, so... Uh, Hopefully we'll, you will be more familiar at least. Yes. That voted no in the first question, you'll become more familiar with these uh, technologies for, for the museums today. So this is interesting for us because uh, especially at the end of the webinar, we can also invite you to follow us, uh, to discuss uh, with us uh, uh, in, uh, uh, in the Digital Lab. There is a forum. Uh, in the forum, you can, uh, you can uh, continue the discussion uh, with us. Uh, for example, could it be interesting uh, uh, receive information regarding uh, what type of tools, uh, uh, what type of museums, uh, uh, what uh, are your needs regarding uh, these, uh, these uh, uh, tools? So, uh, this is a list regarding uh, what uh, we uh, um, what the results uh, regarding uh, our uh, research uh, uh, conducted in uh, in the Rainerit and uh, the main uh, uh, the mainly uh, uh, the, the way that the museum are using artificial intelligence in museums and in cultural heritage sites. Uh, Use user and human approach, uh, sensor center on uh, visitors, new points of view and perspective regarding uh, collection, Me, uh, create uh, an interactive and memorable experience, uh, digital experiences, emotional engagement for learning motivation, storytelling and social media sharing, and user generated native uh, content. So, um, some important. Uh, uh, studies uh, uh, and um, report we analyze. This is one, uh, maybe someone you, you know, this is a Museum Innovation Barometer in the edition of 2021, uh, produced by Museum Booster, and uh, this is the most important annual report on technology in museums, and they uh, was focused on artificial intelligence and museum planning toolkit uh, produced by Museum and Artificial Intelligence 
network, a network founded in uh, uh, 2019 by uh, Onald Murphy and uh, Elena Villa Spes, and they uh, underlined uh, the, uh, the potential of uh, artificial uh, uh, application in museum file uh, context. And uh, uh, this is a quote, uh, they uh, say that the computer vision can help visitors to engage with collection in a new way, uh, create, uh, uh, to enrich the museum uh, collection data, and this is important for the impact on the user experience, and this is near what we are um, developing inside uh, uh, Rainery. Today, produced also a list an open and updating list, and you can see uh, the data uh, from the all the years, and uh, it's growing, uh, and the trend uh, of artificial intelligence and computer vision technology is uh, a topical trend in museum context. Uh, now I finish my uh, presentation introducing some examples uh, regarding uh, uh, what uh, museums, uh, a selection that I made uh, for uh, uh, example on artificial intelligence and uh, computer vision tools in museum. I start with this famous uh, uh, example, Google Arts and Culture, and this is important for us uh, to, uh, to be inspired by this uh, example because uh, uh, it's a, a playful engagement. Uh, uh, you um, visitors can uh, take a selfie from uh, themselves or from the pets, for example, and to uh, create a, a relationship between the, the images, the selfie, and the, the databases of the artwork. It's important to ask visitors initially, uh, also without visiting the museum, um, there is an interaction with the, the first person engagement, and uh, then uh, there are the information related to the story of the artwork, and then uh, create a relationship uh, to share with uh, the experience with, uh, with friends. Another important uh, uh, application for us uh, regarding artificial intelligence was the possibility to engage uh, museum visitors uh, using chatbot. This is the most famous uh, uh, example of the Anna Frank Museum uh, Messenger Bot uh, to recreate uh, artificial intelligence program that can recreate and mimic the human interaction. Visitors chat with, with museum like, uh, like a friend. Uh, there is also a video, maybe you can, uh, there is the link, and then maybe I invite you to, uh, to see the video because directors say an important, uh, uh, say that uh, artificial intelligence is all about humanizing technology, and Anna Frank House is all about human connection. So museums are places to create connection, especially when they are working with the young users. The half of visitors of these museums are under 30. So we know that uh, teenagers uh, are more interested than in, in chatting than in the contact contact. So uh, they uh, mm, uh, create uh, uh, recommendations, social interactions are really important. I return in the Google Arts and Culture. Another example is uh, this uh, uh, Google uh, X degree uh, of uh, separation, uh, the possibility to uh, use machine learning experiment to uh, create a path between uh, two artworks. So the user can select an artwork and another, and uh, uh, there is uh, this is an example, maybe in the other slide, I made, I starting for a dress, a woman dress, and another sound from another artwork on, uh, on left, on right, uh, Banksy uh, painting. And, and the parts uh, was really meaningful for me because they select other similar images with, with dress and painting of Banksy with women dressed. So it could be uh, really interesting. Another example is also um, uh, to use artificial intelligence to make uh, the collection more accessible, create uh, tags, uh, manually and testing with computer vision, Metropolitan Museum for Art in the USA, um, 
create this uh, possibility to increase uh, uh, and uh, the, um, the user engagement and uh, became a collection more searchable and uh, browsable online. You can see in the images, uh, create also uh, a visually similar art, uh, starting from an art and receive other uh, similar artwork by shape, by color, by thematic uh, subjects, uh, and so. Game Studio is uh, another important uh, project uh, in collaboration uh, between uh, Microsoft and uh, the Met. Uh, the, the, um, the artificial intelligence use uh, exploring uh, uh, the, the artworks and uh, uh, generate uh, uh, images, uh, uh, for example, between a goblet and uh, a cup. Uh, so this is interesting to create uh, a matching between uh, two images. And uh, another one, uh, ah, okay, the Tate Modern in uh, England uh, create also a virtual gallery. Uh, they recognition, uh, they win, uh, was a winner of the uh, prize uh, regarding digital innovation, that, but artificial intelligence program compare photojournalism uh, and uh, the British artwork. And the, vis and the um, visitor can visit the gallery. Uh, this is an uh, example, uh, interesting and uh, uh, meaningful uh, uh, relationships uh, like this uh, or like this, for example. Uh, another important uh, example uh, for our inspiration was uh, the Cleveland Museum of Art. Um, Art Lens Exposition is a famous uh, um, installation like a strike pose. Uh, visitor was invited uh, to uh, emulate uh, the pose of a sculpture and they receive uh, uh, a feedback uh, regarding the accuracy of their pose, or also make a phase. Uh, there is uh, artificial intelligence for facial recognition and uh, match uh, visitor facial expression with one of artworks uh, in the museum collections. And of course, uh, share the experience with peers, with friends. Uh, the final example, the last example, is uh, the Salvatore uh, Dali Museum uh, USA and uh, create immersion engagement. There is uh, a work session uh, where people can uh, take a selfie and uh, uh, use the style transfer uh, to see uh, their selfie in cubism style, for example. Or uh, this is a real fantastic installation, the Dali lies. Uh, there is a reconstruction by uh, machine learning, a great work. I invite you to uh, visit uh, and to see, to watch the uh, YouTube uh, uh, video. There is a reconstruction, create a version of Dali's likeness and uh, displayed on uh, monitors in museum. Each monitor is related, different, uh, uh, is related and tell different uh, stories. Uh, you can see in the, in the images, and this is an innovation that gives visitors a point of view that uh, they uh, never read. And uh, in the final, in the, in the slide, the other uh, image, uh, there is the final of the interaction, but really important. Dali uh, take a picture to uh, the visitors, uh, and the visitors receive uh, the, the picture by email, by text message. And so this is an interesting engagement uh, between the uh, museum and uh, the visitors. So, uh, uh, we was inspired by uh, this example, and we uh, decided in our Turkey strategy to use and uh, to produce, uh, to create, to develop uh, interactive tools in digital and physical exhibition, to create a new way to document and share museum collection, and uh, create digital tools to increase the user engagement in digital and physical exhibition. 
Of course, uh, we, we see uh, uh, example related to big museum. And uh, our uh, question was how to uh, provide these, uh, uh, these uh, tools for medium, mid and small uh, organization. We uh, conducted uh, analysis uh, in the other deliverables and uh, we invite to, uh, to read and uh, in the next month is uh, the materials uh, and the um, best practice in the digital lab. But it's important for us, uh, our process is also considering innovation not as, as a result. But, but a process. Digital uh, transformation and innovation uh, is a process for the Renit Consortium because for us uh, it was important to map the current use of technological tools and the human resources for using them tools inside the cultural organization. This is extremely important and this is what we made to create a strategy to provide the implementation of digital innovation in museum and cultural spaces and uh, develop a uh, piloting uh, a toolkit, uh, but also uh, not only the results, of course, the, the codes, the open, uh, the open source codes, but also materials, uh, also training, also best practice, for uh, professionals that uh, are uh, working in uh, in museum. So, uh, Marco, the floor is yours. Now you can continue. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, uh, as you mentioned, uh, you have seen uh, big organizations receive uh, very nice uh, and advanced tools by other big organizations. So, our goal is to democratize the access to AI and computer vision tools. So our toolkit development strategy is about open sourcing the tools, using advanced tools, so base them on the use of AI and computer vision, be as much as possible as inter uh, interactive, and be mobile first and web first, so that uh, these applications can be used also on the devices of the visitors, and not only as, uh, as installations, as we have seen before. And uh, so we are creating and we have created a number of, uh, of, um, of applications within the toolkit, along with games, with uh, tools for performances and this set of webinars, and then also digital exhibitions, e-shop, news and such. And uh, we are starting now in November to release these tools on the digital hub. So you can see here our plan of release. So at the end of November, there will be another webinar where, where we will present a first couple of tools, strike a pose and face fit that will let you to be at least on pair with the, the Cleveland Museum of Arts, hopefully. And if you're interested in this, I suggest also to, if you wanted to ask us about how to implement in your own museum, in your own experience, uh, for your own research, this tool, please contact us in, in the, the digital hub, in the Renerit digital hub, there are forums, you can contact us. Now it's the time to go toward the analyzing a little bit more in detail, the basic technologies that are required to implement these tools. I will provide you now an overview of these technologies so don't be scared. I will talk a little bit about AI and uh, applications of AI to computer vision. And then I'll show you a set of applications that we have developed, uh, describing what of the tools are needed to implement these applications. So you can see how technology can be effectively used to provide new experiences. So let me share now the screen because I have some videos to highlight everything. I hope that the screen is visible, isn't it? Okay. I assume yes. So let's talk a little bit about artificial intelligence. So nowadays, a vast majority of the services that we are using 
from streaming our music, streaming our videos, buying stuff online are based on the use of artificial intelligence. And uh, why not use artificial intelligence, not only for uh, being consumers, but to provide better visitor experience in the domain of a cultural heritage, either in museums or in cultural tourism locations. We can exploit AI both to improve the visitor experience, but also to help the professionals in the management and maintenance of their collections. So in the 50s, Alan Turing uh, almost defined the field of AI as an imitation game. So it was thought, how can we understand if we're dealing with something that is intelligent or not? So it's, it was the Turing test, an operational test for uh, the intelligent behavior of machines. Can you understand if you're talking with a human or with a machine? If the interaction becomes undistinguishable, the idea was, okay, the machine is as intelligent as a human. Nowadays, the view of AI is a system that is capable of uh, doing more stuff, extracting information from uh, the environment, sensing something, understanding the environment and the objects, and perhaps do something as a reaction to what is uh, in the environment. Nowadays, machine learning is uh, the basic tool to implement AI. And within the field of machine learning, that is the technology that helps to learn, categorize and make predictions based on some data, deep learning is a, a specific technique that has made these tools able to work in the real world. In deep learning, and in particular in deep neural networks, the building blocks are filters that extract some relevant features characteristic of some input data, as you can see in the image on the, on the right. And each filter extracts some information that is processed by another layer. And layer upon layer, you create deep stacks of filters that are able to extract more and more meaningful and high level information from the raw data of the input. And then from the high level information, we can get uh, some relevant results like understanding the content of the image. So to be able to react to it. In training a deep network that is uh, modeled somehow in its building blocks, to behave a little bit like a, a, a biological uh, neuron, we apply a set of very simple mathematical operations. And uh, during the training of the network, the system must learn how to weight the various inputs. And in order to do so, we must provide a huge number of annotated examples so that the machine will learn automatically the best combination of the weights to obtain the desired results. Computer vision becomes an enabling technology for many applications, especially in the context of cultural heritage, where we are sensing a lot of the experience through our eyes, through vision. So there are some layers in the definitions of what is AI, machine learning, and deep learning. We can say that AI is the overall the effort to automate intellectual tasks. And machine learning is one of the tools that help us to implement the generic goal. And in particular, deep learning is a very specific subfield of machine learning. It's the one that is most fashionable and the tool that apparently in our experience of the latest years work best to solve many hard problems. And 
why deep learning has become fashionable? Because in uh, the multimedia and computer vision community, where I'm working in particular, it has been observed in the last 10 years that this technology has been able to achieve the best overall results in all the technological competitions that have been devised by this machine learning community. So nowadays, this type of technology has become sort of a, the basic technology to apply AI in the real world. These are good to algorithms to solve many different tasks. And as it was said by Paolo, AI museums can be applied to solve many different tasks, from chatbots to use machine vision, for example, to automatically tag images, to track the attendance of the visitors, uh, to assist visitors with visual, in, with visual impairments. So what are now interesting computer vision tasks that can be solved using AI. Let me present you some specific tasks and then we'll see how this task can be employed to solve real world uh, problems in the, in the cultural heritage domain. So, Let's start with the basic task where deep learning uh, had shown that is the go-to technology, image classification. In image classification, the problem that we are trying to solve is to classify the overall content of an image. Typically, we ask the neural network to guess a number of most probable contents, let's say five, as you can see in this image. For example, in uh, the second image of the neural network is very confident and says there is a high probability that the content of the image is about a container ship. In the last image, it's very probable that it's a leopard. If it's not a leopard, the neural network says that it could be a jaguar. And if it's not a jaguar, there is a little bit less probability that it's a cheetah. And then there is a little bit less probability that there's no leopard. So there was an international competition about guessing and uh, classifying the content of the images. It was called this uh, ELSFVRC competition. It was the ImageNet classification competition. And you can observe in this schema that reports what was the classification error that in 2012, the introduction of deep learning has changed the technological world in computer vision. So, Solving this problem has led to all the breakthroughs in computer vision tasks. So from image classification, now let's try to see a harder problem, object recognition. Now the problem is that typically images contain more than one content. So you can't really classify these two images. It's better to understand which objects are contained in the image and possibly understand which parts of the image contain that specific image. So we are asking the neural network to find out a box that fully contains the object. So you can observe in these images the results of the neural network that draws a box, tell us what is inside the box, and tell us the probability that that object is contained there. From a technological point of view, this approach has been greatly improved by fast object recognition neural networks that apply a single neural network over the full image. So we don't split the problem in understanding where an object could be and then try to understand which object is in that position. So these neural networks can apply uh, uh, object recognition in real time. And now it's possible to implement fast object recognition even on mobile phones. And actually, one of the applications that are part of the Renair Toolkit that we are going to release open source for you to create a smart guide for museums is based on this type of technologies. Just to give you an idea of what a neural network sees, let's see this uh, simple example applied to a movie 
of what the neural network sees when looking at at uh, the movie uh, the wolf of wall street so this is what the neural network sees you can see all the boxes of the objects that are recognized the parts in black is where there is something that is not recognized by the neural network Was all this legal? Absolutely not. And we're making more money than we need to do with. We don't work for you, man. Yeah, my money takes you. Okay. <laughs> let's go on and let's look at a harder task: semantic segmentation. So, in object detection, you try to find the box that contains an object. In semantic segmentation, you have to find all the separate pixels of the objects in the image. And uh, so the idea is that you are like cutting the silhouettes of the objects, as you can see in this image. As you can understand, this is a harder task. The idea is put a label that describes each pixel of the image of the object in semantic segmentation. This is, a, by the way, this is a basic application for uh, autonomous driving systems. So in this example, you can see a so-called panoptic segmentation. So here, every single pixel of the image is associated to a type of object. An even harder task related to segmentation, instance segmentation. And this task, not only we are interested to put a label on the different objects, but we want to understand what are the separate instances of the same type of object. So you can observe in this uh, example that there are three different zebras identified by the different colors of the patches. So we don't have just a patch of pixels that are labeled as zebra. We can count how many different objects are in the image. Other tasks that are of interest, image retrieval. So the idea is, uh, can you find an image that is visually similar to an example that I'm providing you? It's possible to operate over the whole content of the image, or it's possible, for example, to represent the image as a composition of different parts. This is called content-based image retrieval. Then it's possible also to search images based on a natural language description of the content. So you type uh, the description of the image. Or you can also ask to find images based on an example, combine it with some text that asks to change some aspect of the image. In this context, within Renerit, we have developed a state-of-the-art neural network for the retrieval of artworks, both based on an image example or on a combination of image and text. This is going to be released uh, within the next month, and we will have a specific webinar to describe this particular technology if you're interested. We think that this technology can be very useful to implement systems for the maintenance of uh, archives, of uh, digital archives. Other tasks now where we are merging language and computer vision. So this is the task of captioning. Captioning means it, to ask a neural network to look at an image and describe its content in natural language. So it's like if the neural network is writing the caption of the image. So you can see here some examples of results of such systems. Associated with this task, there is visual question answering. In visual question answering, user can interact with a neural network asking questions in natural language about the content of an image. It's interesting to apply this 
in cultural heritage. Since we may have questions related to the content of the image, that may help, for example, visitors with visual impairments, but visitors may have questions about the context of the image. And so we have uh, systems developed within Brainerit, so you can see the logo, that can answer these two types of questions at once, as shown in this example. So if you are interested in applying this technology that can be adapted also to mobile applications, or uh, you can embed it in your website, please continue to follow us and we'll have another webinar on this. Other applications, sentiment analysis. The idea is to address the recognition of emotions and moods from photos. Many times this is hard. So many neural networks try to understand also a little bit the content of the images and understand if that content is uh, positive or negative. Actually, there are neural networks that are able to deal with many different types of emotions, like these uh, uh, 24 basic emotions described here in this image. As in this example, uh, so you can understand if an image is about a creepy house or a beautiful rose or a famous tower. Then let's continue in the context of uh, recognition. So we have neural networks for face recognition. So the idea is uh, to teach neural networks to understand if two images are about the same person or about two different persons. The neural network will learn to identify persons. But using this neural network, we can solve also other related tasks like perform gender classification, age estimation, sentiment classification about the expression of the person. Or we can use these networks to perform re-identification of the person. So we are not trying to guess the name of the person that is framed, but we can use these neural networks to understand if we have already seen that person. And once we merge these neural networks with, with uh, uh, tracking, so the uh, computer vision task of following a moving object, we have a neural network that is able to perform the task shown in this video. So you can see there are no names here. We don't have the idea about the name. Okay, one of them is Bruno Mars, but uh, there are just numbers. So the neural network knows that it has already seen the person that is labeled with six. And whenever the neural network sees again the same person, even if it sees the person very differently, uh, rotating the image from a different point of view, uh, taking out the sunglasses, uh, taking out the hat, the neural network will be able to say, hey, but I have already seen him. It was number six. So this is a technology that can be used to understand, for example, how people move within a museum in a sort of privacy preserving way. So you are never labeling the person and the descriptor that is learned by the network is uh, private. It's not reversible uh, from uh, what the, how the neural network learns about the person. You don't get the identity of the person. Other technologies that were probably used in that DALI installation mentioned before by, uh, by Paolo, style transfer. Style transfer is a, is a technique based on neural network that is able to take the style of one image and apply it to other images. So you can see in this example, Mona Lisa that has been painted with the style of other painters like Van Gogh or in a cubist style or, or an impressionist style. So here the idea is that we are generating new content that may be useful to get the attention and the engagement of the visitors. Regarding, regarding content creation, uh, 
An interesting application of neural networks is that of video and image restoration. So it's possible uh, to use neural networks to, uh, to transform black and white images into color or to restore some details that were lost in old videos, as you can see in the eyes of the girl in the top right, or that you can use to restore old archive materials that have been ruined by time, like correcting the scratches on the photos or uh, recreating the details that have disappeared due to the aging of the support, like in the other uh, black and white photos that you can see. Here you can see the Renerit logo because uh, we are going to provide tools that we have developed for these. Then we have action recognition. Understand what people are doing. Trying to understand also fine-grained actions, like in this example. If you think about drinking coffee or smoking a cigarette, basically you have the movement of a hand that is moving toward the face, but the object that is in the hand is different. So you have to be able to understand these differences. And the computer vision community has developed many different tasks, like human action recognition, sport recognition, event recognition, and such. And then finally, pose recognition. Pose recognition is a task where the neural network understands the pose of the body, the pose of the face, the pose of the hands, the pose of the eyes. You can understand where people are looking at just from looking at a 2D image. And in the next webinar, at the end of the month, we are going to release two applications that are based exactly on these tasks of computer vision to create more engaging museum experience, asking people to replicate the poses of artworks, either with the body and with the face and the expressions of the face. But what can go wrong when we apply this neural network? Well, there are several possible issues. Sometimes neural network gets fooled by small changes in the images. So each of us can understand the content of the images in the left column and the images in the right column, but they have tiny differences in them that are highlighted in the column in the middle. If neural networks are not properly trained, providing many different examples, it's possible that neural networks understand that the images on the left column and on the right column about completely different stuff. Then we have to understand that these neural networks are not really behaving our human visual system. If you show this neural network these images, they will understand that they are about completely absurd content. The content, uh, so the labels that you can see below each of these images is what the neural network thinks is shown in that image. Probably, except the bagel, I say that all the others are completely absurd. So probably there is something here that completely fools the behavior of the neural network. And then there is a, another risk that the neural network learn wrong things. That means the bias and uh, the annotation errors that can be made when creating uh, the training data lead to unexpected behaviors by the neural network. In this example, I'm showing you something that can be tragic for, in certain case, uh, um, a deep network, a convolutional neural network that was approved to be used as a medical device in the European market to detect skin cancer actually was not properly trained. So the neural network understood that if there is some pen marker on the skin nearby 
uh, nearby uh, some nevus like here, probably it's cancerous. Because when the neural network was trained, the images that were used for training contained these markers that were made by the dermatologists. So the neural network uh, could mistake a dirty hand for uh, something perilous. So we have to be careful when training these neural networks. So now that we have seen the basic technologies and also a bit of caveats about using them, let's look at some cultural heritage applications and how to make them. I'm going to show you some examples of applications that have been developed in our lab. These applications are not part of the Renary Toolkit, so you really have to wait uh, for the next webinars uh, to learn about our applications. So this application was made in collaboration with Museo del Novecento in Florence. And you can see in this video, we developed at the time an Android application that recognized artworks and applied style transfer to your own selfies. So here the system took a picture, recognized it, and upon recognition, it allowed you to apply the style of that painting to one of your photos. I have to say that in Renerit we have developed uh, a new application that uh, works much better in recognizing the artworks and the details of the artworks. So wait for the next webinars for it. So what is inside this application? The problem that we have to solve is recognizing the artwork. It's a problem of instance recognition, not object recognition, because artworks are, I'd say, almost by definition, unique. So you have different instances of the artworks. In that, in that old application, we used, uh, we didn't use a neural network. We used something called exemplar SDN. So to filter the selfies, we used style transfer. So a style transfer is like applying a filter to an image. In this case, the filter has been learned by a neural network. Then we have to solve some technical problems. You can think you can think about applying the filter on the mobile on the device of the user, but this is an expensive application, so we had to use a client-server architecture. Let's look at another older project called Mnemosyne. In this uh, in this system, we added a number of fixed cameras in Museo del Bargello in Florence, and we used these cameras to look at how people moved within the hall of Donatello, that contains a large number of masterpieces of the Italian Renaissance. Using fixed cameras, it's possible to even compute how distant is a, people, is a person from an artwork. And uh, we can decide what are the hotspots of the, the artworks and understand how much people get nearby because he's interested. And then we can follow as a person moves through the museum, understanding the pattern of the visit in order to provide them at the end of the visit and let me skip a little bit the video, to provide a personalized guide about the visit with suggestion about other artworks that may be of interest depending on the profile of the visit. In order to preserve the privacy of the visitors, persons are recognized based on how they are dressed, so we don't use any face detail to recognize them. And after 
providing uh, the guide, the data is then discarded from the system. So what is inside this application? First of all, we have to recognize where there is a problem, where there is a person, sorry. This is a problem of object detection. So the problem is understanding which objects in the images are person. We use a neural network for this. Then we have to compute the distance from the artwork. This is a problem of computer vision called camera calibration and real world distance computation. You don't need neural networks for, for this. There are other techniques in computer vision that performs this application. The idea is that we can map every pixel seen in the camera to real world coordinates. Then we have to track how a people moves within the museum. This is a problem of person re-identification. We have to compute a descriptor of the person from the dresses. That's why it's privacy preserving. And then we can use this to track the movements. No identity is associated. No personal features are used. Then we have to provide suggestions on other artworks. This is a problem of recommendation. You can use collaborative filtering. And then there is a problem of designing the interface, designing for a touch table, simplify the interactions and mask the latency of the vision system. Other application about creating a guide that is able to recognize uh, artworks when they are nearby uh, the visitor and uh, separate them from the persons. So here you can see that we are recognizing objects, personal artwork, and when the artwork is large enough, so it means you are interested, you are nearby, we can recognize which specific artwork we are looking at. And here you can see we are running on a mobile device. How does it work, this system? Let me skip this one. First of all, we have to recognize what is a person, what is an artwork. This is a problem of object detection. We can use a neural network for this. Then we have to recognize which specific artwork is being shown, is being framed. This is a problem of instance recognition. In this case, instance recognition can be cast as a problem of content-based image recognition. So it's a problem of retrieval. We can use another neural network. Then we have a technological problem, how to speed up these two different tasks. So we can use, in, in particular, a, the same neural network, looking at the different layers of deep neural network. Then we can create other smarter guides, for example, to provide information when people is in, not talking to other people. You can add the audio classification using neural network. You can understand if somebody is moving. So the guide should not provide that information because uh, you're not really interested. We can use the accelerometers of the mobile phone. Then we have to solve the problem of dealing with different uh, devices and different operating systems for mobile phones. Let's finish with the last application, and that is about the modern identification system to create personalized audio guides. So in this last system developed by us, we identify the visitor in real time. We get some data about the visitors, so like the age, the gender. We can try to recognize the emotions and build the profile of the user and the history of the visit again to create a new smart guide for each of the visitors. So you can see here in this example that was uh, presented very recently in the most important conference in multimedia. And uh, so you can see that the user approaches a location and then uh, his pattern of the visit will be checked and compared with the pattern of the visit of other visitors. And uh, we can understand uh, the uh, age range of the visitor if he's really interested, then looking at where the face is looking at, so we can understand if he's really looking at an artwork or not, and uh, compute how much time he's spending. And then looking at the pattern of the, his visit, we can provide uh, specialized guides, like, for example, uh, under, providing him a guide uh, uh, that uh, highlights the differences of artworks that are about the same topic, for example. 
So comparing two different artworks. This is the famous canvas of the penitent Mary Magdalene by Titian. Titian presents her in a decidedly sensual way with a busty bare breasts. During your visit, you spent time observing another painting of the Magdalene by Artemisia Gentileschi. The contrast between sensuality and faith is resolved by Tiziano in a much more provocative way. In Artemisia's painting, the nakedness of a shoulder is barely shown as Magdalene reaches out to push away a mirror, symbol of vanity. So what is in this uh, system? We need to use phase detection. So phase detection is a specific version of object detection. There are neural networks that are specialized only for this task. And uh, we can add also neural network that provides information about the gaze. So to understand if you're really looking at the actor. Then we use face recognition and matching. So we use the special neural networks trained uh, to recognize persons in order to compare them. We don't want to put a name on them, on the visitors. We just want to put an anonymous ID. Then we need neural networks trained for attribute recognition of gender and age estimation. This is a tricky part, plenty of issues with dataset biases and perhaps even with the labels used to understand the gender. And then emotion recognition is used. As well, we have issues possible issues with the training of this network. Again, we risk to use biased data sets. So let me conclude this uh, presentation about the techniques. And uh, let me open a super short uh, questionnaire. And I hope that you are seeing it. And please vote about uh, these type of applications that may be of interest for you. I invite you all to, to, to vote for this. I see that a lot of people is voting, just the last ones, please. Anybody else is willing to vote? Okay, let me stop the voting and share the results. Okay, I have good news because all these applications are part of the Renair Toolkit and at the end of the month, we're releasing the first set of applications for the gamification for user engagement. And uh, following, you'll find the applications for the multimedia retrieval, smart tourism guide, multimedia chatbots, and also cultural tourism. So we are releasing all the source code, and you'll find it on the digital app of, uh, of Rainerit. I invite you to attend the webinar uh, at the end of the month, uh, where we'll describe the first set of applications so you learn how to find them how to reuse them and uh, i have finished my presentation we are just a few minutes late let me stop the recording